there. Um, did you pick up this map? Put it on the table, and so you could look at it, okay? That way you know what, where to order. And it's available on Amazon. And if you brought, uh, if you, like I asked you, uh, you could buy some extra copies and, and, um, and donate it to the people who may need them. If you did that, you can give them to me directly at the end. Okay, not now, but at the end, or you can leave them there on, on the table as well, and I'll be happy to pick them up. And, and I know if people needed copies and they couldn't afford them. So let's begin today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. As we open your word before Lent, I ask you to bless our time together, inspire our words as we pray. Glorify your name always. Glory to the Father and to the Son. As it was in the beginning. And I'm so happy because I've received so many compliments about my new hair. Anyway, uh, this coming this coming Wednesday is already Ash Wednesday, so we're getting ready for Lent. And uh, in my last parish where I was, I put a big sign up in front of the church and also took out an ad in the paper. And the ad in the paper and the sign uh, said, Get your ash in church on Ash Wednesday. So, same message for all of you for this coming uh, Wednesday. Get your ash in church. Okay. Uh, for some reason, uh, one of the more, most popular days for people to go to church, but it's a good thing. And so let's talk about Lent before we go into the readings. There's 40 days in Lent, and the 40 days comes from the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert, and the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the desert as well. And the word Lent comes from the Old English word meaning to lengthen, signifying springtime, that during this time the days get longer. It's a period of 40 days lasting from Ash Wednesday, which is already this coming Wednesday, until Easter Sunday. This year it's 47 days because we have one extra day. This, this is the leap year. And you ask, well, how come it's 47 days and Lent is 40 days? Well, because Sundays never count as a day of Lent. Because Sunday is the day of the Lord and we never fast on Sunday. So many times we hear people, especially before Lent or during Lent, people say or they talk about giving something up for Lent. You know that talk, I'm giving up something. Maybe you've grown up that way. People were talking about I'm giving up something for Lent. And in fact, I've already heard people talk that way too. Now what are you giving up? Well, this idea of giving something up is not anything traditional to Catholicism or Christianity or the practice of Lent. This was traditionally a time for us to work on our conversion. Not to give something up for 40 days, in other words, as is very popular. But to give something up for good. Or develop a practice for life. Not just for a time. It's a time to work on your conversion. And so that's what this period of 40 days from the earliest times of Christianity was used for, to examine your life, 
and to see what you need to subtract or maybe something that you need to add to your walk here on earth. And so the idea of giving something up temporarily and then going right back to it and resuming the practice of whatever it is that you gave up after Lent is over doesn't make any sense. Like, for example, if you give up chocolate or candy and you only give that up for Lent, you know, you're not going to give up chocolate or candy for the rest of your life, are you? I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but do you see the, the, the Lenten practices that we are supposed to take on are to be life changing how is giving up chocolate or candy going to change your life some people are saying I'm giving up coffee are you going to give up coffee for the rest of your life I'm really good. <laughs> I think the people around me suffer and I'm Early Christians were interested when this, when this practice of Lent developed. Early Christians, when they developed and when they put this period together into the life of the church, uh, they were interested in using this as a way to get rid of something in their life that was not allowing them to fully follow the Lord. That is why whatever it is that they were looking to give up, they were looking to give it up for good, not just temporarily. Think about that. Think about it this way. If you were going to give up gossip for Lent, why would you resume gossiping after Lent? Mm -hmm. Or if you were to add five minutes of prayer to your day during Lent, why would you stop after Lent? It's like, the, you will notice this, those of you who go to daily Mass, uh, the, the number of people who go to daily Mass during Lent increases. Why do you stop after Lent is over? That is why if drinking, for example, is not a problem for you because you only have a glass of wine with dinner, it doesn't make sense to give up drinking for Lent. However, if you are a drunk, <laughs> if you're an alcoholic, then you should give up drinking not just during Lent, but for life, and get yourself into an AA program, Alcoholics Anonymous program. Now that would be a real Lenten resolution. If you have a drinking problem, if you get drunk and you say, well, I'm just going to give up drinking for Lent, then you're not really making any life changes. If you spend too much time, for example, watching television, it shouldn't be something you are looking to eliminate from your life just for Lent. It should be something you are looking to do for life. In other words, our Lenten resolutions should be life resolutions. Not Lenten resolutions, but Lenten resolutions that I want to make permanent for life. To change for good, not just for a period of 40 days. And so, for example, a real Lenten resolution doesn't look like this. A real Lenten resolution isn't, I'm giving up the glass of wine that I enjoy, or the chocolate, or the coffee, or the candy. A real Lenten resolution looks like this. I will quit smoking. If you want to quit smoking, you're just going to quit smoking for 40 days. No, quit smoking for life. That is a real Lenten resolution. Or drive within the speed limit for life. Deal with your past issues by seeking counseling so as to get emotionally healthy for life, for the rest of your life. Forgive someone for something that they have done to me and let go of it 
for lying. Stop holding a grudge forever. Come to Mass on time <laughs> and stay for the entire duration of the Mass. How many people leave Mass early? You know the first one to leave Mass early was Judas. He was the first one to leave Mass early. Wasn't the Last Supper the first Mass? And read about it. Judas was the first one to leave Mass early. That's why in my last church there was a big sign, okay, because people were leaving church. Judas was the first one to leave Mass early. <laughs> See, this is something that we should work on for the rest of our lives, not just during Lent that I'm going to come to Mass early and maybe spend five minutes extra after Mass thanking God for the gift of, for that great opportunity. Ask my spouse for forgiveness. Not just during Lent, but every day before we go to bed. So as to never go to bed angry with one another. Now that's a real resolution. Quit working so much and spend more time with my family. Take more vacation time. More vacation time. So very important. So people have a real issue with devoting time to their family and their private life. Jesus spent three years in public life. Three years in ministry. He was 30 years old when he left his family life, his private life in other words, and entered public life. So for every one year he spent working out in public with the rest of the people in ministry, he spent 10 years recharging his batteries with his family, his private life. So your family life, your private life is 10 times more important than your public life, your professional life, in other words. But we have turned that around. How much people, you know, they spend 14 hours sometimes a day working. There's how many people I meet all of the time who have so many regrets that they didn't devote the time to their children. Then once those years pass, you can never get those years back. Think about it. Your kids need you more rather than your money. How many children today grow up on the street and the street devotes time to them? If you don't devote time to your children, the gangs will, the drug dealers will. Oh yeah, it's a real epidemic. But no, there's the message we are bombarded with is that, you know, our families, our children, they need more stuff. Bigger homes, that's why you got to work more, so that you can provide for your family. Provide. Providing for your family means providing yourself to them. Making yourself available. Jesus sanctified family life. God could have been born in any other situation. God could have come into the world to save the world in all sorts of ways. And yet, God chose to come and save humankind in the context of a family, sanctifying family. The family we call holy, the holy family. The family's holy. Another resolution for life. Stop judging people and pointing fingers at others. That's a resolution for life. Thinking of myself as less than rather than more than others. Quitting gossip for life. 
In other words, quit talking bad about other people. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. The Bible puts it in another way. If say only the good things men need to hear. The people in your life have life bringing them down as it is through all that they have to go through. Don't add to it. Resolve to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> when in doubt, shut up. <laughs> How about, I know this is one that I, I it's, it's hard to mention, it's, it's hard to mention this one here in this context, but how about quitting gambling for life? Mm. Oh my gosh, I can feel the stones. Did I tell you I was walking through Red Rock? Of course I was going to the buffet, okay? And, uh, this lady stopped me, she says, Father, Father, come here, come here. She recognized me. And so I went over and wanted to say hi, and she was there. Um, punching the, the, the slot machine with her oxygen tank and a cigarette. <laughs> I'm surprised they allowed that, you know? Cigarettes with oxygen. <laughs> she says, Father, come here, come here. So I went over and she says, bless my machine, please. I said, well, do I get 10%? <laughs> <laughs> so I have met so many people who have had their lives destroyed through this horrible addiction called gambling, and it is an addiction. You know, if you keep feeding that machine, you don't have any self-control. Maybe you need to give that up for life. There's an idea, not just for Lent, but for life. There's other healthy habits we can develop, healthy ways of entertainment. How about adding a prayer routine to your daily life? You know, one of the reasons why people are surprised when I tell them, for example, that I wake up every day at four in the morning. Four. I wake up at four in the morning, then I pray for one hour till five o'clock, then I eat, and then I go to the gym, and some of you have seen me there uh, at the gym, and I go to the gym, and then my day begins after, after the gym. And I have a whole routine. It's called structure. We are missing that so much in our life. When we structure our life, I do this at this time, Develop that in your life. Sit down with a notebook, and maybe this would be a good Lenten life resolution. Say, this is what I'm going to do at this time, this is what I do at this time. De develop a routine. It helps us in our life. You know who else has that? Pope Francis. And if it's good enough for him to have a routine and a structured life, it should be good enough for us. And maybe, just maybe, you could add daily mass to the routine. Or start small. Maybe I'll start going to mass once a week extra besides my Sunday obligation. I'll go one other day. Like uh, 6 o'clock on Tuesday. Plenty of room on Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Our church is huge. But adding prayer to my daily routine, or maybe if I do have a prayer routine right now, maybe adding five more minutes, or reading the Bible every day, a little bit, as I've told you before, like a chapter. Don't sit and, you know, you're going to, don't get overwhelmed. It's like going to the gym. You start small. If you go and start lifting big weights, you're going to give up because you get sore. You've had that experience. You know, you've heard of people who go and they start lifting big or start running five miles right away the first day and then they get all sore and then they'll never go back and they've already paid for the membership. That's why they want you to sign up for a two-year contract, okay? That's how they make their money, okay? Because people go, they start off, and then they never go back. 
as you start too much. And it could also be with our life of prayer and discipline. Make confession a regular spiritual practice for the rest of your life, not just for Lent. But Lent is a good time to go to confession. And we have our Lenten day of confessions here at uh, St. Joseph, husband of Mary, on Monday, March 7th. All day, all day, we're going to have lots of priests who will come. Nice ones, okay? I even, <laughs> yes, and I've even convinced Father Mark, I've even convinced Father Mark to invite this one priest that I met who's deaf. He <laughs> can't hear. <laughs> I know you have a big line. <laughs> well, he's hard of hearing. He's not really deaf, but he'll <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. I don't want you to go with it. Put that on your list. Mark 7. What about, and here's something that, you know, and this is a real addiction too, overeating. There's something called Overeaters Anonymous, as there's Alcoholics Anonymous. Yet yeah, it is a support group, a 12-step program, Overeaters Anonymous. How about quitting overeating for life? Mm. Or wasting food. Remember that? Miracle when Jesus fed the 5,000. Afterward, after everybody ate, Jesus told them, pick up all the fragments. And the Bible says they filled 12 wicker baskets full of fragments. Pick up the fragments. How much do we waste? Especially here in the United States. When we go to the store, and this is very, this, I know this very well, because I'm, um, you know, I go shopping with my family when I visit them in Poland. And also in Mexico, when I lived in Mexico. People, we don't know how quick we have it. We go to the store and we don't even think. We just place in the basket. And the basket gets full and then you pay, you take it home. And how much of the food is wasted? Just look in your refrigerator, how much food you waste. People in Poland, for example, my family members, they go shopping almost every day, if not every day, virtually every single day, and only buy what they will eat. Same thing in Mexico. Here, we don't think about that. That's why we have these huge supermarkets, not small little markets anymore, because we just get, because we think we need more. That's our mentality. And the Bible says something different. Less is more. You ever thought of cooking less? Maybe going to bed hungry? Being in solidarity with all the vast majority of the world that actually goes to bed hungry? Do you know the vast majority of people in the world go to bed hungry? We don't. That's why we're now the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, where they were coming out with a new statistic, it's something like we're pushing 70% of the American public in the United States is pushing being obese. We're not talking overweight here. Obese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Making resolutions for life. Like getting healthy by incorporating an exercise routine into our life. Start small. Maybe I'm going to resolve to Take a walk every day. And then I'll progress. And maybe the next day. One month I'll walk for half a mile. The next month I'll walk for three quarters of a mile. Start small. Make a resolution, for example, to never get drunk for life. The Bible does not prohibit drinking. There's nothing wrong with drinking. Even Jesus drank. I got news for people. Okay? They had wine at the Last Supper. Also, Jesus made wine, turned water into wine. There's nothing wrong with drinking. But the Bible says, 
those who get drunk shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say those who drink, it says those who get drunk. So maybe making a resolution that you will never get drunk for the rest of your life. Or how about, I will actually work on the issues that have allowed me to be overweight and then resolve to keep it off for the rest of my life. None of the yo-yo thing. I will work on what it is that I need to do in my life. And so, these are real Lenten resolutions. Make a real resolution. A Lenten resolution for life. Not a Lenten resolution for 40 days, but for life. So as to bring real change. That's what God wants for us. Now, as you know, the Lenten journey is about journeying with our Lord Jesus as He journeyed for 40 days in the desert. And so let's read the account which we will hear this coming weekend about Jesus' uh, experience in the desert. And so listen to the Gospel of Luke. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days. What happened in the Jordan? He was baptized. So after he was baptized, he then journeyed into the desert for 40 days. To be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live on bread alone. Why was Jesus able to say it is written? Because he knew his scripture, he knew his Bible. How did he answer the temptations of the devil? With quotations from the Bible. That's why we need to know our Bible as well. Then he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a single instant. The devil said to Jesus, I shall give you all of this power and glory for it has been handed over to me, and I may give it to whomever I wish. All this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus said to the devil in reply, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Then he led him to Jerusalem made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to the devil in reply, it is also written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Now, Lent, a journey into the desert with Jesus, is it not? Unlike Jesus, who was human like us in all things but sin, we avoid at all costs the desert experience. We are all baptized as Jesus was in the Jordan, and then he was led into the desert. He did not avoid the desert experience like we want to at all costs in our lives. And the only way you can make a real Lenten resolution and keep it for life is if you enter the desert experience of hunger and thirst as Jesus did. 
It says when Jesus was in the desert, he was hungry. He hungered. What happens in the desert? We are to experience hunger. If Jesus experienced hunger, what makes you think you won't? We avoid the desert. In other words, the loneliness, the loss of familiar support, the grand stillness, the hunger, the longing, the thirst. We run from the desert as fast as we can. What am I talking about here? This is represented, this running from the desert is represented by so many of us avoiding the reality of life. That is, the suffering and the problems and the issues and the obstacles that we all face as part of our creaturehood. The desert experience is a real experience as part of our life. We want to go away from the desert, run from the desert, and into an escape. That's why so many of us today, we run as fast as we can to the casino, <laughs> to the bottle, get drunk, alcoholism is so rampant, to drugs. There's an epidemic going on in our country of drugs, heroin addiction. To your work, how many people want to escape? Just work and work and work and work. To pornography, a very real addiction. To sex, or the internet, you're constantly distracted on the internet, you're always on there. Like Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> always on Facebook. I always say, what do we call the Bible? We call it the book, do we not? The good book. I always tell people, less face and more book. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good lengthened life resolution? Less face and more book. Put that on your refrigerator. <laughs> what about the phone? It's unbelievable. You go to the restaurant, just watch the people at different tables. They don't talk to each other anymore. They're sitting there on their phones, texting away, or whatever they're doing, checking things. You know, we're so attached to the phone. Even people at mass. I've seen people at mass. And no, they're not taking notes of the homily. <laughs> <laughs> they're texting during Mass. <coughs> or the television. Mm -hmm. The soap opera that comes on at 8, the one at 9, and the one at 10. Shopping. Food. I know the one about food very well. That's why I was 300 pounds at one point in my life escaping the reality of the desert. Very real. Money. How many of us, you know, I only get rich in this. Oh, that's the one thing that's going to make me fulfilled in life. Only. Or, and here's one that will surprise all of you. Religion. How many people look to escape the desert with religion. You say religion? Yes. Religion. How many people do you know who have become religious fanatics? People who have religion answer everything for them. And where religion rules their life. Mm -hmm. Not God, but religion. For example, God doesn't call us to judge, and yet they judge. God doesn't call us to hate, and yet they hate. 
people who blow themselves up, who have invaded the Catholic churches here in Las Vegas. Their, their religion is all, it's their escape. God doesn't call us to exclude, and yet they exclude. Religion can become a real escape for people in their life. Avoid that at all costs. God calls you to be a normal person. Nobody's going to want to join Christianity. That's why today the fastest growing religion is the nuns. Not nuns that wear habits, okay? But nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Because young people especially, they look at religious people and they say, why would I want that? when they're always pointing fingers. Look at what the Lord gave us, the Lord our God gave us in our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Why is the world, and especially, see, the, our current Holy Father is very unpopular with the so-called religious right. Very unpopular. Why? Because the religious right doesn't want to meet the right Christian. Okay? That's what I said. In, in Pope Francis. But yet, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, is extremely popular with non-believers, those who are not religious. Why? Because they see in him the face of Christ. He doesn't point fingers. And we, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, are not called to point fingers either. We don't have all of the answers. We're on the way. And we'll be very surprised. I mean, when we get to heaven, you'll be very surprised who's there and who isn't. Before you start thinking, you know, all these people are going to be excluded and you'll be, you'll be included, you'll be very surprised. The right attitude is the humble attitude. Maybe I'm the one who's actually excluded or who will be excluded. That's why I need to work for the Lord to include me. The fact that we're Catholic doesn't make us better than anybody else. It only gives you more responsibility to be more loving more kind, more generous, better to work on myself, not on others, on me. Work on the other, work on myself in my life. God doesn't call us to point fingers. For how many, for the people who have religion rule their life, Religion has provided for them a sense of false security, a club mentality that makes them feel safe and sound, make them, makes them feel better than everyone else that isn't part of the club. Only we are going to heaven, and unless you join us, you're going to hell. You heard that before. That's why you need to join us. Everyone else outside of the religious club is doomed on the wrong path. They are the saved ones. They are saved. That is why so many cults and sects are, sects are so popular today, including one of the fastest religions in the world. One of the fastest growing religions in the world, Jehovah Witnesses, who exclude everyone and anyone who doesn't fit their mold including their family members. I have seen families broken up like you can't believe by Jehovah Witnesses. They break up families. And they have the club mentality. Unless you're part of us, unless you join us, you're wrong. Only we will be part of the 144,000. We will be saved. You're all going to hell. That's why you've got to join us. We've got the answers. 
Religion has them so trapped that they would let their child die without a blood transfusion. Yes, their own child, because the Bible supposedly prohibits the transfusion of blood. That's why they have a hard time with us Polish people, because we like blood sausage. <laughs> <laughs> they would have a hard time with Filipinos, because the Filipinos like blood pudding. <laughs> I don't like that either. <laughs> Religion is supposed to enhance your life. It's about love. God is love. That's what religion is supposed to be about, not about exclusion. That's why in the Catholic Church, as the Pope says, everyone is welcome. Everyone. All people. What happened in the desert to Jesus? The devil is present there. In the wilderness. Jesus confronted the devil. What do you need to do? You gotta confront your demons too. Don't run from them, but confront them. He did battle with the demon, didn't he? He battled. He responded. He didn't run away. How many people here today, how many of us, and you know, whenever I talk to you, and sometimes I talk very harsh, I mean, I mean it's harsh, but I mean, it's very stern. Because they said, you know, Jesus talked with authority. But when I preach to you, I'm also preaching to myself. Because I need to hear what I'm saying here too. I've got stuff that I need to change as well. So when I tell you to do things, I'm telling myself too. I'm included in this as well. I hope you know that. We, gotta, we all have to battle our demons, whatever they are. All of us. And how many of us here today will avoid confronting our own demons because we are afraid to enter the wilderness? <laughs> How many here will refuse to confront the demons of their past, such as the fact that you have been raped or abused? And the statistics are huge, the amount of people who have been raped in their life or abused or mistreated. The fact that your parents hurt you, your husband or your ex-spouse hurt you by cheating on you or abusing you. You need to fight this demon and get counseling, but you refuse because you are afraid. How many here need to forgive and let go of something that someone did to them or a past hurt or experience, but you won't because you refuse to enter the desert? We don't want to enter the desert. How many people are addicted to alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, pornography, or food, and refuse to seek help from a 12-step program because you are afraid of the wilderness? How many people feel alone and are single, but refuse to reach out and seek a suitable partner for yourself? And you say, well, I'm still, you know, my husband or my wife has been only dead for six months or... So what? You're not used to being by yourself. Well, what will other people think if I find someone and, and get married or date? Stop worrying about what other people think. Do they pay your bills? <laughs> Do they pay your bills? Are they going to live your misery for you? I don't think so. CatholicMatch.com <laughs> This is a real issue, you know, I bring this up sometimes because there's so many people who are very lonely. Very lonely. And you're lonely because you want to. Get out of that comfort zone. There even, you know, you come here 
Turn around and meet the person, you know, meet people. The internet can be used for very good things. It's a gift from God. We can misuse God's gifts in our life, as the internet can be misused. You know, for example, wine has great benefits, health benefits, but it can also be misused, can it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people here have not been to confession in years and will still refuse to go because you are afraid? You're afraid to go. Some of the most wonderful experiences, life-changing experiences in my life have been in the confession. But prepare to go to confession. Don't just come and not be prepared. You should prepare. Make a good examination of conscience. Write a list if you need to of things you want to talk about. You can bring the list and then later on burn it or shred it or whatever, okay? Don't be afraid. It's the devil that's making you afraid because maybe you had a bad experience. I've had bad experiences in the confessional too, but that hasn't burned me. We've all been burned in our life many times. If you let every bad experience in your life that you've had keep you from making progress, you'll never grow. Ever. That's the devil. You've got to battle him in the desert. Some work and work and work and think they need to work and work and work. Work is their idol and the pursuit of money, fame and status their goal. They will refuse to enter the desert of, of confronting the demon that says you need more money, more things, a bigger house. The demon that says your children need more stuff. How many people have people in their lives that are bringing them down? abusing them, sucking the life out of them, and you refuse to confront them because you don't want to confront them. In other words, you don't want to face the demons. Face them! And maybe you need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. If you're in an abusive relationship, an abusive relationship, this doesn't mean that it might be your husband or your life partner or whatever. It could be a friendship. You could call it that. Or somebody in your life. Cut it off. Bible makes it, Jesus makes it so clear. If your eye causes you to sin, cut it off. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. <laughs> he's, he's so simple, our Lord. We, are, we, we make things complicated. You know what you need to do, so do it. That's what this time is for. The only way to get better is to enter the desert and confront the demons that are afflicting you. Face them head on and not run from them. In other words, let's enter the desert. There in the desert as Jesus was, you will be reminded of the great hunger and thirst that you experience in the desert. How hungry we all are for acceptance, for love, for security. You know, the desert experience is not just something that happens once. It, has to, it happens over and over again. Because what happened here? The devil departed from Jesus for a time, it says. When the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. The greatest temptation the devil can place on you is to make you feel you're alone, that God's not with you. In other words, that you can't get over whatever it is that you're facing in your life. And the devil departed from Jesus for a time. The next time the devil tempted Jesus was on the cross because he's hanging there. The desperation wasn't there. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me. Why have you abandoned me? Don't we cry that? that was the, that's the desert, the cross. The experience of the cross. Where are you, God? 
God's with you in the desert. He's with you there. And if God brought Jesus through his desert, through his cross, God will bring you as well. How thirsty we all are. How much we hunger. Maybe you are sick or your family member is sick and you are hungry to get better or to see them get better. Maybe you have lost a loved one and you want the hunger that you feel, the hunger of loss, the pain to end. Maybe this whole election cycle this year is making you sick and hungry and thirsty for something better, for a different climate. Certainly making me feel that way. The experience of the desert. And here's something that is very important for us to get. Ante crucem nihil defensionem, which is Latin for before the cross there is no defense. As much as we want to escape the desert, we can. If Jesus could not escape the desert, what makes you think you can? So stop with the distractions. Stop thinking that if you ceaselessly preoccupy yourself, you will be spared the pain. So many of us think that only if we do not pay attention to the terrible uncertainty of our condition, the fact that life is a big unknown, it will all be okay. Perhaps if we entertain ourselves to death, we may be able to divert our way through life. And then comes Lent every year to remind us of the desert. You can't escape it. The devil is here with his tempting tactic. Turn the stone into bread. In other words, reach for the bottle. Reach for the drugs. Reach for the food. Reach for pornography. Reach for sex. Reach for money. Reach for more stuff. Reach for the casino and you will be full. We can have it at our back and call, says the devil. By the snap of your fingers, the hole at the bottom of your being will be filled. Doesn't work that way. Not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, only God satisfies. No thing and no one. The temptations Jesus underwent were to escape from the mission of his humanity, to deny our dependent condition. All of us are dependent on God. The devil said to him, dodge your humanity that you took upon yourself. Jesus didn't. Jesus showed us how we should live. Not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus entered the desert and took the hunger as well. He resisted the seduction of the devil. And the evil spirit left. The demon left. The devil left. When you resist the devil, solid in your faith, God, through His grace, will help you. And the devil will leave. For a time. And then he comes back again, as the Bible says. In other words, every single Tuesday, I read the reading from the first letter of Peter that says, be vigilant. And in other words, stay awake. Be ready. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. You know what the roaring lion means? 
looking for souls to devour. <laughs> Resist him solid in your faith. And our faith says what? The very last things Jesus said. That's our faith. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands. In other words, what is that? Into your hands I commend my spirit. I trust you. I trust you. In my desert experience. My trust is completely in you. I trust you. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Not into the hands of something in the world or someone in the world, but into your hands I commend my spirit. God is with you in the desert as God was with Jesus. Do not be afraid. How many times is that phrase in the Bible? Do not be afraid. 365 times. And if you don't believe me, Google it. 365 times. You think God has a message here? We are to trust Him and face head on whatever it is that we need to confront in our lives. For the great hope of our faith that we profess is not that God comes to rescue us from the experience of the wilderness. As God did not rescue Jesus from the experience of the, of the desert or the cross. The, did God spare his own son the experience of the desert? No. And you are God's son or daughter, right? And God won't spare you the desert experience either. God didn't spare his son from going through the cross, the pain, the suffering, the anguish, the problems, the obstacles. No, God did not spare his own son so what makes you think that God will spare you? The great hope of our faith is not that we will be spared, but the great hope of our faith is that if we are willing to trust, in other words, into your hands I commend my spirit, if we are willing to trust in the great unknown. That's why, you know, Socrates said, the great philosopher, the only thing is that I know is that I know nothing. It's all a great, great unknown. Our whole life, we know so very little, and yet we, we think we know so much, don't we? That's the big problem with religious people so many times. Is we, we think we know so much, and yet we know so little. The great hope of our faith is not that God will come and rescue you from the wilderness. But the great hope is that if you are willing to trust in the great unknown, the great spirit, the creator God, that we profess faith in, then we are in for a big surprise if you trust. And what's the big surprise? The resurrection. The resurrection. If we trust, we're all in for a big surprise. Resurrection awaits us as we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we are here because we want to trust you ever so more in our life, in this walk. And as we enter our own desert experience, we know that you are there with us, guiding us, accompanying us by our side, and that it will all be okay because you are with us. And as we trust you and place our life in your hands, as we say those powerful words, into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands we commend our spirit, O oh Lord, our life, our very being, our existence. And we trust in you 
as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless all of you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated for one minute and for a couple of announcements. Uh, first, uh, those of you who have not gotten the book that I wanted you to read for your Lenten journey, Consoling the Heart of Jesus, there's a copy there in the back you can look at it so that you can know what to get. Uh, absolutely fabulous. Cannot recommend this enough. But just read a few pages at a time and take notes even when you're reading it. It's very powerful. It's based on uh, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. It's his 30-day spiritual exercises. People go for 30 days on a silent retreat. You can do this with this book. It's absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. It will change your life in your walk with the Lord. And as part of this is I Thirst. God thirsts for you. You will get to know that in this book. This book revolutionized my own spiritual journey, so that's why I cannot recommend it enough for all of you. Uh, if you haven't written down your email there in the back, uh, I will be sending some things. I'll be working on that. And then um, uh, you have you been consulting our um, calendar? For the class, so you, those of you who you know that for the next two weeks, right, we do not have class because this room is not available. Okay, so we won't meet for two consecutive Mondays. Not that I'm going away anywhere. I'm not. Okay, <laughs> and that's a message to all of you. You know, uh, I have been kind of inundated with people wanting to meet with me. So be patient. But if you do need to meet and talk. I love to meet with all of you. Call and um, set up a time. Be happy to meet with you if you'd like to talk about some things. Um, that's why I'm here. Because you know that I love you very much. And you all live in my heart and you don't even pay rent. <laughs> and, uh, don't forget that. Um, so I'll be happy to meet with you if you, if you need that. Um, and I wish you a very, very wonderful Lenten journey as we start this time. Make it a good one, okay? 40 days, and then I'm Ash Wednesday. Get your ash in church on Ash Wednesday, okay? Um,